We're live now. <laughs> I just turned you live. It is 7.01 and 25, 26 seconds, so we should go ahead and get started. I guess this will be all that will be here this evening. Um, again, as we, we're hoping to just sort of keep us within about 45 minutes so it's not too long on the video. Um, so uh, glad you guys are here. Um, good to have about seven, eight people here tonight. And uh, hopefully some folks will start coming in in a little bit on our, um, on our virtual community. And so we'll, um, if not, then we will have a good time, won't we? And so we'll uh, uh, start with a word of prayer then. God, we give you thanks for this uh, evening as we are entering into this fall season. Uh, today, at times, it didn't seem like fall, but it sure felt good. And uh, we're still uh, blessed in the things that are happening around us as uh, um, we're seeing some of the changes that take place, especially with the leaves on the trees and just the cool, crisp air that uh, uh, hits us early in the morning as we get out. And we're just uh, thankful that the season is here. We just ask your blessings to be upon us as we uh, study your word tonight, as we've been able to gather back to, uh, to our Bible study and um, be together, whether it's here in the church or, or on Facebook or, or YouTube, wherever we might find ourselves. We ask you to just bless us in our time of uh, study and in the words that we share. And uh, thank you for all you do in Christ's name. Amen. So, um, yeah, again, we're... Um, just uh, to give some house cleaning notes is that we'll only do this every other week. I thought that because it's kind of hard to do a week where I do it recorded and it kind of messes us up a little bit because I've enjoy I enjoyed the interaction the first week we were together. I think the questions and the comments and stuff like that that we had kind of helped it out. And so we'll only do Bible study every other week and it'll be here or um, folks can join us um, on uh, Facebook if they'd like to. So we're our... We are studying the book of Genesis, and um, the last time we met, we did the first three uh, chapters. The first three chapters kind of go very quickly in the history of the world, it seems like, where we see God creating uh, everything, uh, creates the day and the night, he created the seasons, he created the plant life, he created animal life, and what of the life did he create? Humans, Humans didn't he? And what were their names? Adam and Eve, weren't they? Adam, he created out of the dust of the earth. Eve, he created from the rib of Adam, one of Adam's ribs. Uh, they were given dominion over all of Eden, and uh, except that they were not allowed to eat of the tree of, of, good and, of, of, of life and the good of evil. There was two trees. Um, and, the, and God said, if you ate of the good tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you will do what? Die. Die. <laughs> yes. Um, we know that they kind of overlooked it for a little bit, but then who came in and sort of tempted Eve? The serpent. And then Eve kind of helped push Adam along. Actually, when we talked about it, it really didn't take him much to eat the apple, did it? it she just kind of just handed it to him and he took a bite. They realized uh, that they gained a sense of knowledge of themselves and the surroundings, didn't they? They clothed themselves and they hid from God, and then God kicked them out of Eden is basically what happens. And so that's sort of where we are at this point uh, because of their sin. We would call it the first sin that they uh, are now required. What's the punishment that Eve received that will go to all womankind? Children. Yeah, painful childbearing experience would it not, is what it would be. And then Adam, for all men, is to do now what? He will have to toil in the soil, basically, won't he, to grow his crops. You know, Eden was going to be this perfect place where I assume that they weren't going to have to do a lot of that and fruit and Food would just be there for them in the midst of all of this. Um, but now they have to do this all on their own. And I assume that the childbirth was going to be a different kind of thing. And so now it's going to be more intense uh, for women. So y'all can blame Eve for that and Adam too and the serpent and in those ways. So now we're going to get to um, another section of scripture uh, as we begin in chapter four because 
there's uh, been some time here. They are out of Eden, and it says that Adam had and um, had and and this is I'm reading from the um, um, the New Living Translation is what I read from. I'm not sure what you are guys are doing. Um, it doesn't matter. It should say similar words. It says Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth, she gave birth first to Cain and said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And these are the very, you know, Genesis has those very familiar stories, doesn't it? You know, and they're a very immediate, it seems like, in the midst of it all. That here we see um, uh, Adam and Eve, and now we see Cain and Abel. And in a nutshell, before we read it, I mean, what, what do you think about when you think about Cain and Abel? There's only one thing we think about, isn't it? Cain did what? He killed Abel, didn't he? So we're going to read about it a little bit and discover a little bit more about this. Uh, when they grew up, it says that Abel became a shepherd and Cain cultivated the ground. So basically, Abel is tending um, livestock. It doesn't say what type of livestock, except it does tell us what his gift will be. So undoubtedly, he has everything, and including uh, sheep, um, and then we have Cain, who is basically a farmer, isn't he, in, in, a, in, in a way. He's farming the land. He's producing crops. Um, and so that's where our story leads us as we're going into this little section. Verse 3 says, When it came time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops to the Lord as a gift. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of his firstborn la lambs of his flock. Now, you have to sort of catch those statements, don't you? What does it say in there? Did, did you notice something in there that kind of helps us to kind of maybe lead us into why this happened, this, this murder? Cain only brought a little bit, but he, he had done it. Abel brought the biggest part he had. Mm -hmm. Actually, it says he brought the best, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, the first fruits, where it almost seems like Cain just says, ah, Here's a few of these little things. I'll, I'll give them to God. Um, it was interesting. I was trying to, re, you know, trying to discover what was the purpose of this or why was it that when we read this next section, it says that the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he didn't accept Cain and his gift, did he? Which made Cain very angry and look dejected. And so I was looking that up because it seems sort of weird that, that God would not accept what would Accept one but not the other, especially when you're thinking about these are the only two humans in, this, in a way right now, aren't they, that we know of. Have we really seen any sort of um, uh, requirements given as far as it is to, uh, to what you are to present to God? It doesn't say it per se, does it? But we almost have to imply that maybe there is something, isn't it? Uh, one commentator was writing that there are ideas that are out there that maybe the idea of sacrifice had already been in place there. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, they had to have some way to atone for their sin, didn't they? And what happens later as we look at Israel and we look at the Hebrew people, what do they do when it comes to accounting or atoning for sin? What is it that they offer to God? Sometimes an animal, and sometimes it can be child. No, not a child, but well, yeah. it, it will most of the time it'll be either an animal or it can be your first fruits if you're a farmer like Cain would have been. But what God would have expected of Cain would have been that he did what? He brought, brought the best of his produce first. And then the rest is for himself, isn't it? Much like what Abel does is he brings the best lamb. When we look at the sacrificial system later in Scripture, the requirement of the people, especially when it's to bring an animal, it is to be one that is perfect almost, isn't it? Without blemish, it's to be, uh, um, and it's supposed to be the best of what you bring and offer to God. Um, you know, we, we look at that with, with 
stories about ourselves to say that, you know, we're to bring the best that we can offer to God, not just our leftovers, because that's kind of what Cain did, isn't it? And, you know, that's, that's what God doesn't expect. He's, he's, he doesn't want people to just kind of lollygag through all of this. He wants them to bring the best and most appropriate. So one of the authors said that maybe there was this sacrificial system already sort of implied and in place at this time because when we think about the story of Genesis, things run pretty quickly, don't they? And we don't see this huge time span. I mean, look within two chapter or two couple verses, you see that Adam and Eve had sexual relations. Then they had a child. Then they had a second child. Both these children had grown up and they're kind of on their own within four verses, right? So Genesis goes pretty quickly. So there's probably a lot of details we miss out on that's not there. But it's not that it's, it's unimportant. It's just that it wasn't part of what was written in some of this. I mean, we have to think about the fact that these first parts of of, of the Old Testament, a lot of this is during a time where there's no writing. It's just all oral tradition. Do you know what oral tradition is? Oral tradition, uh, when we think about the Old Testament, especially the first five books of the Bible, would be that everything was handed down through words. That what, that, that Joe, what you and Eddie would do would tell the stories of your family and you would pass it to your kids in hopes that what they will do later is they'll pass it to their kids and then they'll pass it to their kids. And so that's what this system was based on. And so sometimes you kind of have facts that will stay with you, but sometimes you just kind of go, let me just give the, the, the details that are necessary for now. And eventually they kind of weed themselves out, don't they, some of the things. So it may be that we don't need to worry about that, but we just understand that, that in this particular instance that there was some reason why um, Cain's gift was not accepted. And part of it is, I think, is going back to says that he just gave something whereas Abel gave the best. But the one author said that it looks like that there's, uh, it reminds us of the types of sacrifice. And there's, there's the type of sacrifice, whether it's a lamb or, or, or fruits uh, or vegetables. There's the quality of sacrifice, which almost seems like the, the, this one and the next one are what happens here. The quality would be that Abel gave the best of what he had, didn't he? Whereas Cain kind of just threw up hodgepodge of stuff together in a grocery bag and, and handed it off to God. And then there's the heart of sacrifice. And by heart of sacrifice means that you're giving because oh, God is so special to you. And maybe that's the difference here is Cain didn't have that special relationship with God that Abel did. Either that or he was placing his stuff better than God. God mm. realized he was yeah. being right number two, but he should have been right number two. Sure. Yeah, you could be yeah, that too. I, I'm the one who created this. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot to play in there, but it just doesn't give us a lot, does it, when we think about it? But it's what we can also say about this this becomes we've already had our first sin, haven't we? Where they disobeyed God. Now we have our first murder, don't we? <laughs> you know where he does what? Uh, he becomes very angry and dejected, to which in the midst of this, God says, why are you so angry? Why do you look dejected? Uh, you'll be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Um, that kind of goes back to what we talked about, isn't it? You need to be doing what is right. Or he says, sin will begin to crouch in at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it, and or it'll be its or and be its master. He says, sin can either control you or you can control the sin, right? And anger can create what? It can cause us to sin, can it? Because it can create hard feelings. It can create distance between people, and it looks like in the midst of this, what happens? His angry anger is so overwhelming, he takes it out on his brother, doesn't he? One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and he killed him. It was interesting to think about that because, we, you know, when you look at it in the sense of um, uh, maybe some legal terms, you kind of realize that was not a crime of passion, was it? It would be a really a premeditated um, 
uh, calculated murder is what this was. He was plotting. It doesn't tell us the time span, but it almost seems like this wasn't just that afternoon, was it? Or the next day. It almost seems like this was eating at him for some time. God told him what, remember? S don't let sin what? Control you. You need to control it because something bad will happen if you don't. And it did, didn't it? So he attacks his brother and he kills him. Interesting part of the story is, is I like how in this Old Testament, the, the conversations that people have with God, that it's, it's like one of us sitting together and have, having a talk with one another, isn't it? Um, we don't think about that today, do we? You know, our relationship with God is a little different how we talk to him, isn't it? Um, but back then, they kind of had these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And have you noticed, even with Adam and Eve last week, or the other week when we talked about them, when they uh, ate, of that, the, ate of the fruit, covered themselves with the fig leaves, when they heard God coming, what did they do? They hid. Because when we think of God, when we, how do we think of God? Do you think you can hide from him? <laughs> and when we think of God everywhere, don't we? All the time. And here it is that they're hiding from God. So now, what happens to Cain in the midst of this story? Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? Now, in your mind and in mine, I, I have my thinking here too. Do you think God already knew? Oh, yeah, I think God knew. Well, why wouldn't he? He's God, isn't he? He knew, I think, that Adam and Eve had messed up. But what happens is, is as one commentator says, they did what? They lied about it. What does Cain do here? One sin, anger caused him to sin, and that, that anger was part of his sin, which caused him to do what? Sin again by murdering his brother, which caused him to do what? Sin again, which is to cover up what he had done. And don't we see that in some of our characters here in Old Testament quite a bit? You know, I think about David sometimes and, and how he tried to cover up the sin of, with Bathsheba by having, you know, sending her husband to the front lines to get killed in the battle of war so that he can cover up what he had done. We see this with a lot of our characters in the midst of Scripture and the things that they do, the brothers who took Joseph, I mean, they lied about what happened to Joseph, didn't they? By saying, he got attacked by a lion, look at the coat and the blood all over it, you know? And we're going to see it over and over again, that one sin, lie, one, one sin creates another sin and creates another sin. And we're guilty of that, too. That's why sin entered in the world, didn't it? And now it's there because of these guys. Um, so, I like Cain's response because you can, you can just almost see him doing this, can't you? Well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> you know, I need to be the one to watch him all the time. To which God knew what had happened. Because God says, the Lord says, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God knew he was dead. And it's, there's this dramatic moment almost as he explains to Cain, I can hear his dead body, his dead, the blood from him crying out to me. And you can't tell me where he is. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Meaning that nothing good can happen to him in his life anymore, in a sense, is it? Um, he's not going to be able to do what he used to do. I mean, that was his livelihood, wasn't it? You know, he was a, a farmer. He was a gardener. He was a, per, per, um, a person who grew f vegetables and fruit and toiled the ground like his father was had to do. And that's how the... the the, the fruits of his labor were produced. But now God says, you're not even going to 
be able to do that anymore. And I guess he's saying wherever you go, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to be a homeless wanderer on the earth. That's sort of a weird punishment, isn't it? A weird curse. All you're going to do is wander, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, so, God, so Cain replies to God, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. Now that's kind of a strong statement there, isn't it? And a sad statement that you've been, he's not only feels like he's been banished from the land, but he's been banished from the presence of God. And you've made me a want, homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Now I had a couple of questions when I think about that. Because I'm thinking about how many other people are there? <laughs> and who is it that's going to know him and say, oh, he killed Abel, we need to kill him. You know, that's the funny thing about these first few chapters in Scripture, you know, because we're getting ready to even get to Noah here in chapter 6, um, is it, to see all of this happen, that we realize it was just Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, but all of a sudden they're talking about other people in some way. Um, but it also may be implying to us how quickly, you know, the, the earth is going to begin to populate itself in, in some way, so it has to. Um, but the Lord understands this and says, No, for I will give you a sevenfold, I will, I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you, meaning that they'll be severely killed themselves, won't they? That, that Cain is not a marked man in that sense. This is his punishment. This is, for, this is his burden to bear. And he's not going to have this punishment received from other people. Um, then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. I wonder what that might be. <laughs> be kind of interesting to think about, wouldn't it? What kind of mark would you have on you? You know, maybe it's like a birthmark that some people have. It's an identif identifier in some way that people might say, oh, that's, we can't touch that person. Um, so Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. One of the funny uh, things I read was Nod actually has a meaning. You know, most of your cities have a meaning. And what do you think Nod means? Being the Hebrew and Aramaic. It means wandering. <laughs> it means wandering. I just thought that was kind of neat to think about. That here he is. He is to be a homeless wanderer. And the land he ends up in is actually a, a name, has a name that means wandering. So there we go. That's Cain and Abel. That's their stories. Uh, there will be no descendants of Abel because Abel has been dead. But there are descendants of Cain. And we see that in our scripture here. Um, again, it says he leaves for Nod. And it's interesting because he, he undoubtedly leaves with a wife. Okay. Where, where's this wife come from, right? And we have to look at it differently from how we would look at it today. His wife would have to be who? So it would have to be either a sister or possibly a niece, one person wrote. It could be one of those, you know, because they're going to be... That there, were, there are some who, who uh, commentators that say that there were at least 10 to 12 children of Abraham. You know, they had other children. We just are, are in, you know, privy to hear about Cain and Abel. And then we're going to hear about a little bit later, we'll hear about Seth. But um, it doesn't happen now. I mean, part of it is the, is the genetics of it all is it creates um, a mishmash that... that, that is very debilitating in, 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 in many ways in what happens. But for that moment, and you've got to think about that when Noah goes out and it's just him, his wife, and his three sons and their wives. You know, there has to be, when you're repopulating the earth, there's got to be something going on there, doesn't it? So this is, the, this is what's happening here. And so Cain has this wife. Um, again, yes, it's kind of funny to think about when you read the scriptures here. Um, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. And then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son named Arad. And Arad became the father of Mahuel, Mahujael, 
Uh, and he became the father of Meth um, Methushael, and he, he became the father of Lamech. Now, Lamech is one that we can hear about a little more often at times. Lamech, it says, married two women. So there's a lot of mixed match of people around here, just very closely related that are trying to repopulate this earth um, or populate it in some way. So it says, he gave birth to Jabel. And this was what I found interesting here as you look in these descendants of Cain, you're going to see some firsts. He was the first of those to raise livestock and live, live in tents, uh, which makes me wonder what they li were living in before that. They must have built buildings in some way, or they just lived in the op open ground. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the first to play the harp and the flute. So we have music, don't we, beginning to get started. Lamech's other wife gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain, and he became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. And Tubal Cain had a sister named Naima, Na Na Naima. Um, which I, I wrote in my notes here, uh, you know, that you, you can kind of think about this as the beginnings of civilization, can't you? In the way we think of a society, it has people who need to have certain skills, don't they? Um, while one's living in, in a tent, he's raising livestock for food. Another is creating music, which is very important in a society, isn't it? But then the other who is forging tools, because tools will be become important as well, won't they? And we'll see that as they progress in some sense. So it's interesting to hear how these persons become these experts, they become these first in different things. Uh, Ada and Zila, hear my voice, uh, is what Lamech says to his wife one day. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, the one who kills me will be punished 77 times. Which is sort of strange because I don't read in here where he even killed somebody, did you? <laughs> but he admits to his wives that undoubtedly he has killed somebody. Um... I don't know what to make of that. You know, you see these things in these first few uh, chapters here, and you still have to wonder, what is this talking about? Um, but I think part of it is, is to kind of compare the punishments of what can happen to someone. And it's not as if God, though, said that this is going to happen. It's almost as if he says it himself, doesn't he? That, oh, you know, if, any, if, if, if Dad or if Cain can be, have a punishment that someone's going to have a sevenfold punishment. If it happens, if somebody kills me, it's going to be worse. <laughs> so, um, and then you have the birth of Seth, um, which gives us this idea that there was only three children, but some would say there were a number of children of Adam and Eve. Um, this one named Seth. Um, God has granted me another son in place of Abel. Almost looks like that's who. We're saying that he, she, uh, Seth replaces him in some sense. Uh, when Seth grew up, he had a son, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to worship the Lord by name. Uh, and I think that's sort of Im important for us to look at at the, at the end of chapter 4. At that time, the people first began to worship the Lord by name, which I think sort of implies to us, too, that, that the human race is truly beginning to grow even more than we see here, doesn't it? Because when we kind of count the people here, we really only count, what, less than 10 people. But undoubtedly, there's much more than that. It's just we're not seeing that, or it doesn't want to tell us that. It doesn't need to at this moment. It tells us about those persons who are important to the story, isn't it? And that's what we need to know. Especially when we get to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the story, or it's just telling us about the descendants of Abraham. And it goes from Adam, I mean, from Abraham, from Adam to um, to Noah, and uh, in verse thirty-two. And so um, I'm not going to read through every one of these names. Well, maybe we'll, but I, I'm not going to because I can't pronounce all the names. Um, but the interesting thing about him is is to think about the ages of people, especially when they die, how old they were. It says, what does it say about? Um, if you think about when uh, Adam and Eve had Seth, I think it's in here, it says that Adam was about 130 years old when they had him, when he had Seth. 
we know we think about the day today that's sort of odd isn't it but it's a different set of of a time period isn't it and as one commentator said you're probably looking at it because you were needing to populate the earth so you needed people to live longer didn't you so they're going to have multiples of children so that it could begin to spread around so that we could begin to have people populating this world this is written account of the descendants of Adam and when God created human beings he made them to be like himself he created them male and female and he blessed them and he called them human when Adam was 130 years old he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image he named his son Seth after the birth of Seth Adam lived another 800 years and he had another and he had other sons and daughters and Adam lived 930 years and then he died. That's a long time. <laughs> 930 years, it says. <laughs> Do you reckon they had trouble with their hips and knees and all those joints? That are, I mean, middle age is 500 years old, isn't it? So um, when Seth... That's why he died at 900 years old. They wore everything out. They wore everything out. He died at 930. He got another 30 years. So when the son Seth was 105, he became the father of Enosh. After the birth of, Seth, of Enosh, Seth lived another 807 years and had other sons and daughters. And Seth lived 912 years and then he died. When Enosh was 90 years old, hey, he's a young one, uh, he became the father of Kenan. After the birth of Kenan, Enosh lived another 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Enosh lived 905 years and then died. Now they're getting younger when they have children in a couple places. When Kenan was 70 years old, he became the father of uh, Mahaliel. And after the birth of, he, of this boy, <laughs> Kenan lived another 840 years and he had other sons and daughters. And Kenan was 910 years old when he died. Now, Mahalahil, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, was 65. He was retirement age in this day and age. Uh, he became the father of Jared. And the birth of, after the birth of Jared, Mahal lived another 830 years. He was 895 when he died, but he had other children. Notice that everybody has other daughters and sons and daughters. Jared was 162 when he became the father of Enoch. Uh, Jared will live to be 962 years old and died. Enoch was 65 and became the father of Methuselah. Now, Methuselah, we all know of, don't we? Um, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God, and then one day he disappeared because God took him. What does that tell us? That's one of the stories we think about when we think about some of these historical figures in Scripture, don't we? He didn't really die, it doesn't say, does he? He just kind of went. But it was because of his close walk with God. When Methuselah was 187 years old, he became the father of Lamech. And after the birth of Lamech, Methuselah lived another 782 years, had other sons and daughters, and lived to be 969 years old, and then he died, which gave him the record of being the longest living person, wasn't it? When Lamech was 100 and... Where am I at? Okay. Uh, when Lamech was 182 years old, he became the father of a son, and Lamech named him Noah. For he said, Many, may he bring us relief from our work and the painful labor of farming the ground that the Lord has cursed. And after the birth of Noah, Lamech lived not another 595 years and had other sons and daughters and lived to be 777 years old. Noah was 500 years old and became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He waited quite a while to have kids, didn't he? You know, others had them at a little over 100 years old or just under. You know, he waited another, a, a good uh, 500. He thought that'd be a good, a good ripe age to have children. And so it says he has Shem, uh, Shem Ham, and Japheth. Um, 
just so you know, uh, in chapter 6, we will get into the story of Noah, but I'm not going to get to the story of Noah, which is in verse 9. We're going to wait till the next time we come. But I do want you to look at the first uh, eight scriptures here, verses here of chapter 6, and just listen a little bit of it. We'll, we'll talk about some of it. The people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. Now, here's an interesting selection of scripture in verse 2, and it says, The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Sort of a strange tale we have here, because most would say that, that the possibility of what's happened here, this begins the, the, the downfall of, of even some of Satan's uh, angel. You know, uh, Satan was an angel of God that, that turned on him, rebelled, and all of a sudden here's these sons of God, it calls it, that these are probably some heavenly beings that all of a sudden look down and see that these beautiful women decide they want to marry them, which is sort of odd when you think about the, those characters, but it is somewhat saying there's this beginning of this realm of, of good and evil truly beginning to happen here in the midst of the earth. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they will... For they are only mortal flesh. In the future, they, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So just immediately in chapter 6, we're all of a sudden going, God's going, you're only going to live certainly a certain amount of age. You know, you're not going to be able to live 900 some years anymore. You're not going to have children at 500 years old anymore. You're not even going to be living that long. Um, Part of it is, is I think that he's upset with some of the things that may be starting to happen on the earth. And so he says, we can't have this. In those days, for some time, giant uh, um, Nephilites lived on the earth. And for whoever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient, ancient, ancient times. So some would say that that would be the, the sons, the daughters, the children of these, um, the, the, the sons of God who would be these powerful uh, personages or entities or whatever they are. And, and they become these warriors and heroes it talks about in ancient times. And it's sort of an odd little statement to make, but it's, it's probably uh, some of those characters that they're starting to develop in their own minds of how they can follow them and follow them instead of following who? Instead of following God, isn't it? Because remember, when we see people turn from God, it's usually because they're turning to something else, isn't it? And it's to other characters or other persons or other things. And so here they have their own heroes almost, it seems like. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and saw that everything that they, they thought of, thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on earth and it broke his heart. I mean, it had already been messed up with Adam and Eve, didn't it, when they sinned? Because the intent of Eden was to be a perfect place, wasn't it? Where there would be no sin, where there would be no need for that, that everyone would love God and worship him only in that place. And they could live in this perfect harmony and unity with one another. And all of that changed. And it's getting worse and worse and worse, isn't it? And so here he is, and he says... He, he laments even creating people. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. I feel sorry for the animals, don't you? <laughs> but God, in a sense, I think is going, everything I've created needs to be gone. I'm sorry I made it. But God always has a truly good heart, doesn't he? And what does he do? He says, but Noah did what? Found favor with God. Something about Noah made God say this one. Maybe and we will see that even more in a little, you know, later. Maybe there's something good about this one. And he's not going to do what he's going to do, is he? He is going to do it. 
It's just that he's not going to make it a total wipeout, is he? Because we're going to see that as we enter into the story the next time, which will be uh, two weeks from tonight. We'll begin the account of Noah and his family together. But in the midst of all of this, just these first six chapters, there's been a lot that's happened, hasn't it? There's been a lot of time that's, that's uh, been going on here. There's been a lot of people undoubtedly that's been created in the midst of this time. And people are now just completely populating this world. And but they're messing up. <laughs> and so God's going, I'm done. I've had it. Uh, but there's Noah. <laughs> and we'll read a little bit more about him as we get back together in a couple of weeks. So thanks for guys for coming. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. And we hope that uh, you are blessed with what you've heard. And uh, if you ever have any any comments that you'd like to share, this is for the community out here on Facebook. Just just send us some an email and we'll we'll work towards that. And um, thanks guys for coming. <laughs>